Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I've missed hearing my friend Doug Muzio, professor of public affairs at Baruch College, emote about politics. He did that regularly when he hosted City Talk here on CUNY TV. And finally, I persuaded him to join me. So he's my guest today. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here, Ronnie. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. We've been missing your voice, and I can just hear you now. What's going on in the world? <laughs> oh, God. It's, where do you want to start? Well, I don't want to spend too much. I don't know where to start. That's always the problem. Oh, okay. I want to talk about what's going on in Washington, okay. I guess. How did we get this? I want you to explain to me when they say he's so popular with the Republicans in the polling, so popular, 80 percent, 90 percent, and yet the Democrats found one of their biggest areas of uh, getting people to vote were suburban Republicans. Yep. So who do they include in these polls when they talk about Republicans? Well, I mean, they, they, they include a representative sample, and presumably it is representative of the United States or you know, an yeah. electorate within the United States, 89% of Republicans polled support the president. And it's, and 42, I guess 40 to 42% of the American people approve of his job performance. Now, to me, there's a, a huge <laughs> gap. I mean, yeah. the, how could you be for this president, given all, all, you know, the pathological lying, the misogyny, the, you know, the, the, the girlfriends, the kidnapping of the kids, the jailing of the kids. There's so much that is morally and policy-wise reprehensible that it's dumbfounding to me. I mean, Hillary, I've come to the conclusion that Hillary was right. Most of Trump's supporters are deplorable. <laughs> They're angry, cruel, and short-sighted and ignorant. Do their Pardon Republican me. samples, are they comparable to earlier Republican samples in other administrations? Well, I mean, the, you, you, you draw the sample uh, randomly, and uh, you ask people yeah. what their self-ID is. And, you know, you identify as Republican, Democrat, Independent. Yeah. And, and that's how it works. I'm so just, I asked you because you're an expert. Yes, polling. yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> I just the, want everybody the, to know that the polling is. Are there fewer enrolled Republicans than there used to be? Are there more independents? Yeah. Don't, well, the, generally speaking, the the, the independents is a large percentage of the population. But then, then Democrats outnumber Republicans. I mean, there's and then since we don't have a national election, it's. The 50 state elections I, uh, and how that's distributed is, is altogether different. Right. It's crazy. So we can't account for people voting for him. Is that what you're saying? I mean, you can account I mean, for it. Inside, I mean, inside, we can't intellectually. Well, we can't understand. Well, it. I mean, you we, and have, like we have a problem understanding <laughs> it, but it's understandable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, they're less educated. You know, they're uh, what's they're what's, ignorant. They're, they get their news from Fox News. People who listen to Fox News know less about politics. I mean, you don't get me started. Right. Fox I, News is a phenomenon that we haven't seen before, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, um, Fox it News. Is, it's, it's merged with the Republican Party. Uh, well, it, it's, it's merged the, with Donald Trump at any rate, and well, therefore the Republican Party. But look Party. at the Senate. I mean, the resistance of the Senate members, the Republicans, to criticize him is unbelievable. Well, I mean, forget about it. In, in the Senate, in the House, it's, it's, it's remarkable that out of the 53 Republican senators, there's only a handful that are open-minded enough to criticize the president. They're, they're scared of their base. But it's more than that. Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan, it wasn't the base. It was them. They're not nice people. And, and you know, I, I hate to use the word evil because it, it, it's too broad. They're evil. And they founded the Tea Party, basically. Yes. They were the supporters. Yes. What we've lost, I guess, in government is consensus. Oh, yeah. Well, that I mean, is not a goal anymore, right? No. Oh, I, I mean, you don't have it. And, and the loss of trust in institutions is, is palpable in the United States and globally. People, yeah, are globally less, right. people are less attached and trust the major institutions. And Trump is 
exacerbating the trend by his attacks on facts, on the media, on science. So it, it becomes this totally relative, rel relativistic world that you don't know where it is. So he, he's very dangerous. You can, I, also, you can, you can trace the lack of consensus into the parties themselves. I mean, we're seeing it in the Democratic Party. I, I was going to write something, help, I'm moving to the middle. <laughs> you know? Right. I used to be treated as being the left. I mean, Giuliani used to call me, I don't know what, but anyway. But <laughs> there's no. There's, there's no coherence. There's no holding it together. It looks like the Democratic Party is, you know, engaged in a proto civil war between the, you know, the traditional Democrats, the corporate Democrats, you know, the middle-of-the-road Democrats and the, and the more uh, liberal, progressive, activist wing of the party. And there's, there's a battle going on for the soul of the party. Well, when I was a ref I mean, would I, where would I fit in there? <laughs> Probably as a good liberal. Yeah. Well, I've always objected to that word progressive anyway, the term. Well, I, I mean, it, it was brought in to mask the fact that you were a liberal. Right, right. I mean. So compare the socialism to FDR. Well, it's, the, it's not socialism. If socialism is involvement in the, of the government in key, you know, industries or factors of, 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 of life, then, you know, I, I'd consider him a socialist. The Democratic Socialists of America which is the label that everybody is saying is socialist. If you read their mission, it's very hard to understand their difference between being a liberal Democrat. Yes, I mean, it all, it all so depends. So why did they name it that? I, <laughs> I, I, well, I, I imagine there is an ideological reason for that. There must be some that. difference. Yes, there. and clearly there is a difference. It's a more thoroughgoing critique of the nature of the system. It's a systemic critique. The system is, quote unquote, immoral. You have to change the system. Right. And in many ways, it's hard to disagree with them. Right. You just read the headlines. Well, I mean, it's true you have to change the system. I mean, we agree with that. Yeah, it? but I mean... The, By changing our system would be increasing the taxes on the wealthy. Right, but it's... Helping it's, it's admit, a, uh, it's a comprehensive program. It's it's an integrated program where a lot of liberals are and like me are more you know issue oriented. There's no no theory. The, the, the socialists have a theory, and we'll see if, well, if it can yeah, win. But it's common sense that it doesn't. Our present system doesn't work. Our present not. Well, system, I, mean, I shouldn't say it, system. I, it, I I shouldn't say system. Our present practices. Okay, yeah, but our present practices work for a lot of people. It works for the major corporation. It works for the billionaires. It works for... But it doesn't work for what we understood the United States to be. Well, I mean, we... Didn't we? Maybe not. I, I don't know what we thought the United States to be, and maybe our thoughts about what we thought it should be, it mm -hmm. wasn't. Mm -hmm. You know, where did these, where did these Trumpistas come from? Where did the anti-Semitism come from? Where did the Nazi salutes come from? Where, where did, you know, the overt expressionism of racism come? Come on. It's centered in, it's centered in the president of the United States and his acolytes. So you wrote a book about... <laughs> oh, Watergate. Watergate. And, and, war, and, and applying game theory to right. Watergate. As a matter of fact, I contacted my dissertation advisor, Stephen Brams, who's a world's form, one of the world's foremost experts on game theory, and I started playing with it. But game theory is the theory of rational decision making, and we have a president, for all intents and purposes, is irrational, is unthinking, is uh, react, totally reactive. So it, it makes it difficult to, you know, scope out his thinking because I don't know if he thinks or how he thinks. But now you can scope out the people who are getting the letters from Nadler. And oh, yeah. Comedic, you know, once Cohn testified, 
it opened the door, did it or not? Would you be able to predict well, I mean, that? Uh, you, you have to, in game theory, you have to look ahead and then work backwards to, 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 to find your best move. And it's there's too many variables and, and the main actor is just too irrational. Now, there, he, you know, he often says, you know, I'm not giving away what I'm doing. So there's, there's what was called the madman theory, which is you act irrational to attain rational purposes. So uh, my wife, in the heyday of crime on the subways, when she felt threatened, she talked to herself real loud. And you know, be, be, she was be crazy. crazy, right? And then they would leave, and she used that a couple of times. So you know, there, there is in diplomacy a a a use for that kind of apparent irrationality. But I think it, it it's deeply irrational. He is deeply irrational. I don't know if he's he got the... He contradicts himself all the time. Yeah, and I he's not going to tell what his plan is, and then he announces plans, no, I, and then he doesn't do it. I, so. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at the level of ignorance about basic facts, and it's just appalling. And, and, and there's a lie a day, or many lies in, in many days. It's just unfathomable that... Because of the quirk in the Electoral College, because of the quirk of the Electoral College, the, the guy was elected president. I mean, after all, he lost by three But he may votes. be crazy, or he is crazy. Underneath him, there's a very good organization that is issuing rulings that are very contrary to yeah, what okay. we want. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's, he's, you know, I mean, he, he's those, hired cold executives to be the head of the FDA, and he, he, he hires the people who would destroy the agency. That, that, that's his goal. Now, that's, let's say the Department of Energy. Uh, we need the worst guy possible to run this agency to destroy it. And then, you know, Betsy DeVos, I mean, you know, hire the person who's going to destroy the education system. I mean, and then, Commerce, look at Wilbur Ross. Oh, oh, Wilbur Ross is, is uh, a thug with a suit. I mean, come on. And really, they're, they're in the main second and third raiders because the first, you know, the first tier won't work But for they them. didn't know the people to hire. There's, there, I think there's, there's a group of ideologues that are really in control of what's going on in the agencies. They're the ones oh. who bring the names, and they're the ones who fill in the secondary posts, in, right? In part, in part, yeah. certain, certainly that. Yeah. But I mean, look at Justice Department. You would think that a, a coherent uh, autocrat would do a much better job with the Department of Justice. I mean, he's got, you know, Sessions, who was, you know, a racist, uh, Ignorant. He, uh, and he wasn't good enough for me. And he wasn't good enough. Yeah. Now, within the Democratic Party, I was thinking about it before. We used to have a litmus test, the liberals or the progressives, right? Did you vote against the Vietnam War? Right. Then it was the Iraq invasion. Right. And now it's what? Medicare for all and the Green Party? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the Green Deal. There was certain... I, the Green Deal isn't quite there yet, but... Yeah, there, there are these issues that divide or are meant to divide the American people, but, th but that's a mistake. There is no American people. We are not a people. We are a group of tribes, and you, you've got to recognize that. It's American politics is tribal. It depends on class, race, ethnicity, Socioeconomics, but they're and they're, religion. They're, it's and getting, religion. That's oh, getting to be more important yes, than ever. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, you have the uh, Israel, the yeah. evangelical faux Christians right. who, you know, uh, support Trump at the highest levels of any any group, and it would seem it would violate every precept of Christianity. But there. I yeah. don't think they're really Christians. They haven't read the, you know. Yeah, they don't understand. Yeah. That. And then you've got now the Israeli-Palestinian question, yep. which is being manipulated. Oh, of course. I've, uh, it's, it's part of the 2020 election. Uh, evangelical Christians are deeply wedded 
to Israel, and they're playing that as a, you know, keep keep them in the party, keep them happy. Why are they so close to Israel? Because they believe that they believe in, you know, some end point of history and that Israel will be the center of this end point of, you know, and the day of judgment. I mean, all this, uh, you know. Uh, right. Uh, I'm not going to say mumbo right. jumbo, but. All right, now let's look at state politics. Oh, <laughs> no, you look at state politics <laughs> and city politics. And city politics. It's, e it's interesting to see. Again, it's not a consensus, is it? You have to have the majority in a party, in a, in a legislative body to pass legislation. You can no longer find, I mean, look at what we've, from my point of view, very good laws were enacted in the state legislature. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean. But they couldn't have been re enacted before when the Republicans were in control because there's no common ground. Right, right. I mean, the, the, the Democrats are taking the most advantage out of their overwhelming now a majority in the Senate and, and the, the long-held majority in the Assembly, and they're passing legislation at a record pace. Now, uh, most recently, you have a problem with the governor and the legislature over the revenue estimates, which is a big problem. And uh, once they're at deadlock, then, uh, Tom DiNapoli is going to have to make a decision on which, which one of the estimates are correct, and they're, they're way off. I mean, uh, uh, Cu Cuomo's uh, uh, saying that there's a uh, $2.3 billion shortfall, and the members of the legislature, both the Assembly and the Senate, say, no, 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 your revenue projections are too low, and in fact, this deficit either is mitigated or doesn't exist. So there's it, always a conflict. A dip at one point and then went back up. There's, yeah. a, there's, there's always <laughs> a conflict between the executive and the legislature over the revenue estimates because that is the ball game. That's the money you have to play with. And the city is the same. And the city is the same. Yeah, yeah. So can you, have you been able to um, figure out why the governor and the mayor are at such odds with each other? <laughs> I, I, I'm not a psychologist. So I think this is in the realm of psychology as well as politics. Uh, they see each other as rivals for attention and power, even though the governor institutionally has more power. And this seems to be a personal dislike and, and it's and a dislike of a, a level of intensity that's not often seen publicly. They got together on Amazon, but uh, that didn't work out too well. No. <laughs> they both managed to do a bad job at the same that, time. That's right. Yeah. And then, you know, you have the MTA situation where, you know, the, the governor keeps refusing to admit that uh, he, he owns the railroad. Historically... How has the financing changed in the MTA? <sighs> Federal you, funds? Well, if, uh, probably. I, I honestly don't know. I would. I would just assume that federal funding has gone down dramatically. And the city participation went down over the years, right? Yeah, but now it's back up mm -hmm. because of the conflict between mm -hmm. uh, Cuomo and De Blasio, and we'll see how that plays out. But I don't know. You said you have a, a class, Resiliency of New York, yeah. Sustainability. Is it the inability of elected officials to take hold of the future <laughs> when the results won't be when they're in Ah, that, that, but that's it. Yeah. That, that's it. I mean, you, ha you have to think extremely long time, particularly with climate change, and their time horizons are much, much shorter. So they're, they're, they're bound by the electoral clocks. And if it doesn't fall within that clock, you know, 30 years, who gives, you know? Yeah, right. So did we ever have that? Oh, at various times, I'm sure you, you, you did. I mean, for example, uh, long-term thinking, 
New York City was a pioneer. The the, you know, the grid system of uh, 1811, right. the the aqueduct system, you know, the the Erie Canal. There were there were but people they, who were, they all happened because they needed it, right? Well, they needed they, it, but they had the political wills right. in some form or somebody right. did to actually create it. I remember in the Lindsay administration, it was the first administration in years that had done a master plan. Right. And there hasn't been one since. since. Right. I mean, one of the things is that we don't plan. We don't have a master plan. We have piecemeal, ad hoc land use issues. It's, it's basically a zoning orientation rather than a right. planning it's orientation. It's neighborhood to neighborhood. Yep. And then you don't consider where you're pushing other people to that's the right. next neighbor. That's right. It's really such a frustrating kind of thing. Do you think anybody long range with long range views can ever get elected? <laughs> I, 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 I presume so and I hope so, but in order to get elected, you promise long range and you deliver in the immediate, you know. But you need more informed voters. So ah. now, let's talk about your students. Well, I mean, my students are peculiar insofar as that they're students. I have one class of graduate students and one class of sophomores, honors college students, and they're very aware. they surprisingly sophisticated about uh, things politics. They have, they have things to learn, but uh, they're, they're engaged. Some of them are deeply engaged. I have students in my current classes, both the undergraduate and graduates, who actually work in political campaigns or in uh, issue groups. So, I mean, they're, they're active, but they're working at the same time, so. Do you, but do you have any thoughts about whether students are more engaged than they used to be? I mean, isn't that really gonna be the, seat, the way to Oh, yeah, well, I mean, the electric. I, yeah, I mean, you know, demographic change. Do they get change. discouraged by the, what's happening in the country? Or do they get uh, invigorated? Well, it depends on the individual, really. Some of them get discouraged and some of them get invigorated. I would say that my classes are generally really pretty invigorated in terms of, you know, larger issues of social justice. Mm -hmm. and ameliorating the conditions of the world. And then much more explicitly political, yeah, they're, they're pretty savvy. So you're optimistic. Uh, that, uh, I shouldn't uh, jump to that conclusion. Uh, I'm optimistic <laughs> about the students in my, my class. Okay. <laughs> and other, yeah, Baruch students as a whole are pretty involved despite the fact that they're, they're, a lot of them are working. Are your grand well you don't your oldest grandchild is twelve? Yeah. She's too young, really, yeah. Wait a minute. My youngest grandchild went up to Provincetown during the women's march and spoke in front of nine hundred oh, people when she was eleven. <laughs> oh good. And people stopped her in the street. Yeah. You mean your oldest grandchild? Yeah, the twelve the twelve Fabulous. year old. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah. So where did she get it from you? Oh uh, from and, Barb, oh, please. and your wife? Uh, my, my my daughter and son in law. I mean yeah. we're you know, that's comes, the way we that's are. In families. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So we just have a few minutes. What would you like to say? You don't have to look at mine. Okay, I'm going to ask you some questions. How does it feel to be as old as you are, looking back, what are you thinking right now about what you were asking me about? Several things. Well, I'm appalled. I'm very unhappy that I'm not young enough to really travel around. I'm very jealous of AOC. <laughs> I mean, really, to have the chutzpah to run for Congress when she's how old, 28, 29 yeah. years old, and then to act the way she is, I think it's great. I would be a little more pragmatic, I think, although I'm not quite sure because she should do it and she's drawing, you know. Right. I think it's more like Bernie that's making me crazy. I was a Bernie voter. I wish he wouldn't be oh. around enough of him. Um, why, 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 why do you feel that way too? Because A, he's too old. I mean, I'm old now. He, he's got to pass on to other people. He, he's responsible for bringing yes. a lot of people. Yes. Let them help and do something. He should not be there. Um, and he, he does, he's not warm. <laughs> he's not, he's strident. Yeah. And he's, um, 
He's very good for raising an issue, but it's not. And raising money. He's not, at, he's not raising the solution, I don't think. Okay. Anyway, um, what else? I, I'm sorry about seeing the same problems that I dealt with uh -huh. in 1970 yep. still there. Yep. I mean, it's just incredible to me. Homeless, uh, lead poisoning, all, all these things that were major issues in 1970. So it's, um, I just wish that everybody could have the seventh grade civics teacher I had at Joan of Arc Junior High School, Herbert Eben, because he was the most incredibly gentle, stimulating, relevant well, we, we civics teacher. We don't teach civics. I mean, I, I was on school board for, you know, three, in parts of three decades, and that's one of the things that I advocated for. Right. Civic, I mean, non-ideological, substantive, meaningful dialogue about basic facts of civics. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. And if we had that, I think we would be, it would be better. Are you gonna come back again? Yes, yes. All right, invite now that me. you've been here once, you'll be back. I invite me. Okay, definitely. Thank you, Doug Rosia. <laughs> Thank you. All right.